Thanks, Dr. Barry. Good morning, brethren and sisters and young people and friends. Today, the encounter with Christ is going to be the disciples being taught a very severe lesson. And you're going to see today how frustrated the Lord God with these disciples who were slow of hearing and blind to the truth. We need to understand with the Gospels that we have the same incidents being recorded by a number of different eyewitnesses with different perceptions and different things that they know. And sometimes we need to coordinate the records across two or more Gospels to get the full story that God has concealed there for the wise to dig out and to find and to understand. Today we're going to contrast the Gospel of Matthew to the Gospel of Mark concerning a number of consecutive incidents that happened in northern Galilee. Let's also remember that when we come to the miracles there is, as we're going to see today, carefully selected incidents that differ from the thousands of healings that took place on various occasions. And when we have a carefully selected incident, a carefully selected person and a carefully selected process, then the Lord is trying to teach us a spiritual lesson and we must look for those lessons in those records. Today we have the feeding of the 4,000 we just read about in Mark's Gospel, surrounded in Mark's Gospel by two very carefully scripted miracles. Just have a look at the end of chapter 7 in, in Mark, verse 32. They bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment with his speech. And after the healing of the, uh, after the feeding of the 4,000, we come across to verse 22 of, of Mark chapter 8. They came to Bethsaida and they bring him a blind man. And we're going to see that these two miracles are very much related because they frame the feeding of the 4,000. They are placed distinctly by Mark either side of that particular miracle. Now, there were thousands of people being healed in this northern Galilean campaign. If you look at Mark 6 and verse 56, we find on a previous day, it says there, Whithersoever he entered the villages or the cities or the country, they laid the sick in the streets, besought him that he might touch it at where but the border of his garment, as many as touched him were made whole. So thousands were brought out to him in this northern Galilean campaign. And the same in Matthew 15 verse 30. On another day it says, great multitudes came to him, lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and he healed them. So there were thousands and thousands of people getting healed on these special healing days. But Mark, on this second occasion, picks out two people from the crowd. Because in both these cases, Jesus took them apart and, and dealt with them very, very differently to the others. Let's have a look at these two similar miracles. Now these miracles are linked because there were a number of similarities between the two of them. Both these men were brought to him by other people. Both times they were taken aside from publicity. So they weren't healed as part of the crowd that was thronging around Jesus. They were taken aside because there was a lesson here for the disciples that had to be made distinct from the other healings. Both healings were staged in process. In other words, they were not immediate healings. And that's quite something unique, isn't it? Both were anointed with spittle from the Lord's mouth. Both were touched on the area of the problem. And both were requested not to seek publicity after. Now one was a blind man and one was a deaf and dumb man. What is important to notice that while there are so many similarities, when we come to the blind man, we have in the Gospel records the only record of a two-stage healing. In other words, the Lord partly healed a man and then fully healed him. And it's the only time you ever find that, that there was a two-stage healing in the Gospel records. And there's got to be a good reason for that. You know, the good Bible student says, well, that's an exception, that's something unusual. There must be a lesson being taught there, and there certainly is, as we'll come to see as we get to the end. So why are these two miracles placed by Mark very clearly around the feeding of the 4,000? We need to establish the context of what's going on here because Jesus is very concerned about something around this time and, and we're going to see the Lord gets very greatly agitated and very, very worried about the disciples. And I'll just paint you the picture of what's been going on. 
Jesus, having been to Jerusalem for the past, I was now gone back to the northern Galilee for a very extensive campaign in the north. The Pharisees had tried on many occasions, along with the scribes and the lawyers, to tackle Jesus and had become exasperated because they could not answer him. So what they did now is a very human tactic. When you can't defeat the leader, you isolate him from his followers. And that's what they were now doing. They were picking on the disciples. Why do your disciples pluck corn in the fields? Why don't your disciples wash their hands like the others do? So they now began to try and separate Jesus from his followers. They call it divide and conquer in psychology. And that's what they were trying to do. And this was hard for the uneducated fishermen because they greatly respected these leaders of the law, these Pharisees, these highly religious people, the scribes that had so much knowledge about the Bible. And they were fearful to stand up to these men like Jesus did. And so the battle was on for the loyalty of the disciples. Would they stay with what they'd always had, the religion of the Jews, and their respect for these men, or would they shift their allegiance to Jesus? And that was what Jesus was concerned about. You know, this was a very unhealthy fear they had of these men. Later on, Jesus would say to Peter these words, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, the enemy, the adversary, our opponents have desired to have you. Simon, they want to get their clutches on you. They want to sift you like wheat. But Simon, I pray for you. And Jesus was very conscious that right up until the time of his resurrection, that the disciples were easy prey for these religious leaders because of the respect they had for them. It's like when you try and get convert a Roman Catholic. And you think you're making progress. And they go back and the priest gets hold of them. And their respect for the priest is enormous. And many times I've been told, well, my priest says I shouldn't listen to you, I shouldn't talk to you. And you see, there was this fear coming from their, their whole lifetime of experience of being trained to fear the priest. And it's the same with these men. They had grown up with this, this fear of these, these great leaders of the law and these scribes and these lawyers. It's very likely in Mark chapter 7, in Mark chapter 7, bear in mind these are all continuous events through Mark 7 and 8. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 1, then came together the Pharisees, which had come up from Jerusalem. So they are miles away from their home church, and they are pursuing Jesus into northern Galilee. And when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with their fathers, they unwashed hands, they found fault. And you can imagine they would have picked on the disciples first. You know, don't you keep in your traditions? Have you forgotten the law of Moses? Don't you understand what we say? And the disciples probably embarrassed and took the matter to Jesus. And, and so we find that in verse 5, the, the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why walk thy disciples not according to tradition? But they had found fault with these men. You weren't keeping the tradition of the elders, they said at the end of verse 3. And you see, that's what they were, they were trying to get at the disciples, to divide them from Jesus. And this was great concern to Christ. You could see them wielding under pressure. Now I want you to come to Matthew chapter 15. We look at the parallel record in Matthew first. Because there are lots of details in Matthew we don't get in Mark. And then we'll come back and look at exactly the same story in Mark. And you can pick up the differences we trust as we go along. You know, when they came to Jesus and said, Why don't your disciples wash like we do? Jesus took them on. I want you to notice this attack that Jesus made on the hypocrisy. You can only stand in great awe at the directness of Jesus when he came to tackle the Pharisees and the scribes. The way he exposed their pernicious doctrines like Corbin. You know, the Corbin doctrine said, well, God expects me to look after my parents. But that's going to cost me to do that. So what I will do is I will dedicate my money to the temple. Mind you, I can use it until I die, but because it's dedicated to the temple, I can be excused from looking after my parents. Now that was not a Bible doctrine, that was a Jewish invention to save money. And mum and dad could start on the doorstep as far as I'm concerned because my money's all been promised to God. It was a, a shocking doctrine. Jesus threw it at them time and time again. That this is one of the examples, he said, of your hypocrisy, of how you've rewritten the law of God to, to the commandments of men. And you get out of your responsibilities by your invented doctrines. Just like it was with the cleansing of the temple, do you ever find any Pharisee, any scribe, 
defending the doctrine of Corbyn. They knew it was a rotten doctrine. Nobody ever tried to argue for it. And Jesus was pitting it on a weak point. This is how their traditions had so corrupted God's principles. And so he threw it back at them. You know, just look at some of the insulting terms that he made to these, what the disciples saw as the paragons of virtue. This is what Jesus said to them. Scathing denunciations. Verse 3, you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition. You made the commandment of God of no effect. You hypocrites, your heart is far from God. You teach for doctrine the commandments of men. You know, these are extremely strong terms, aren't they? Hypocrites, blind leaders of the blind, he calls them in verse 40. And that's a fascinating little parable, isn't it? Blind leaders of the blind. So you are people that think you've got the right to lead, and you're as blind as those blind men you're trying to lead. And it's a quite a funny picture. You imagine a whole group of blind men going down through the city centre, being led by a blind man. They wouldn't get very far, would they? And Jesus said, that's what you are. You're blind leading the blind. And he's trying to get the disciples to see that you can't hold these men in such respect as you do. Look what he says in verse 10 of Matthew 15. And he called the multitude and said, hear and understand. Now note that. Listen to what I'm saying, said Jesus. You've got to start listening to the word of God. And that hearing and understanding is the basis of the two miracles that are later on selected by Mark. The people were blinded by the prestige of the Pharisees and the scribes, and the words of Jesus were having trouble penetrating. So there was blindness and deafness that had to be dealt with. <coughs> now come to verse 12 of Matthew 15. So Jesus, having scorched the Pharisees with his words, sent them away. In verse 12, look what happens with the disciples. And this is the proof of what I'm saying. Then came the disciples and said to him, Lord, Lord, you upset them. You know, the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying. You know, they're always telling Jesus, look, you know, don't you realise that they are the Pharisees? These are our leaders. This is our religious institution. And you offended them. And you see, you can see the problem the Lord's got. There's a loyalty to their Jewish leadership. They're worried about them being offended. And Jesus says, well, let me tell you something about them. They are weeds in God's garden. They are plants that God has not planted. And they're going to be rooted up. They are dangerous weeds in the garden of God, he says. They are not of God. They're blind leaders of the blind. I want you to notice, and you should have these words coloured in at the start of verse 14. Let them alone. Keep away from them. You know, that's what this is all about. Keep away from these men. In verse 14, stay away from them. Otherwise you'll be one of the blind men that falls into the ditch. Do you know that illustration? It was so simple, it doesn't need explanation, does it? But you can see the embarrassment of the disciples. So what, what does Peter do? Oh, well, let's change the subject. You know, Jesus isn't seeing the point about offending the Pharisees. Let's change the subject. Oh, no, Lord, declare me the parable. I mean, how do you need to explain the parable of the blind leading the blind? But you see, Peter's just trying to get away from the subject of the Pharisees. Well, it doesn't succeed, does it? Verse 16. Now notice the blindness is the Jews. We'll come back to that when we come to the man who was cured of his blindness. The blindness is the Jews' blindness. Well, Jesus says, are you without understanding also? But he comes back to the point now of defilement. He comes back to the point of, are you defiled by the fact that your hands are not correctly washed? Does that somehow disqualify you with God because you didn't wash the required number of times? And he's getting back to this point. He's trying to get the disciples to see that they don't have a scriptural argument. And so he deals with that matter of cleanliness and, and, and where, does, where does wickedness come from? It comes from inside a man, he says. Those things come out of the heart in verse 18. They don't come from dirty hands. And you see, the Lord is exasperated. He says in verse 16, Are you without understanding? Can't you understand what I'm saying here? You know, this problem of unclean and clean things was a very Jewish problem. They had two things they were worried about. One was washing, and the other was the separating of milk, milk and meat, which is what we call kosher. The Jews are absolutely fascinated with kosher food. 
In the law of Moses it says, you shall not see, or you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. And the reason for that was is that God wanted people to be sympathetic to animals. He didn't want people to be cruel. I mean, how cruel to take the milk from the mother and boil the, the child in it. So there was, a, there was a, just a little comment in the law about being thoughtful. And the Jews said, ah, God wants us to keep meat and milk totally separate. You go to a Jewish campsite and you will find there's a, 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 one kitchen where they deal with milk products and one kitchen they deal with meat products. There are two sets of cutlery, two sets of plates. And everything is totally divided. Just in case somewhere they might have meat and milk come in contact with each other. And the Jews have gone to enormous extremes for this kosher food. And the same with their cleanliness and their washings. And they're still doing it today. Because they somehow believe that if I come clean and I keep milk and meat separate, then God will love me. And then that's how they got into, into ritual and got way away from the principles that God was trying to teach. God's saying, I want you clean inside. The reason I gave washings in the law is I want you to understand it's the clean heart that matters to me. It's the clean mind that matters to me. It's the clean hands that go and do clean actions. I don't want plates to be washed till they, they, they lose all the printing on them. I want you to think about your heart. And so Jesus says in verse, in verse 18, out of the heart come these things. These things defile a man in verse 20. All the evil thoughts and the murders and the adulteries that come out of a man. Not what you haven't washed. And Jesus is, is very, very frustrated with their inability to see that the, that the Pharisees' emphasis on washing of hands is so wrong. So what does Jesus do? Well, he says, okay, pack up your bags, we're going. Where does Jesus go? He goes to Syrophoenicia. Right up in the north. You know, this is the territory of Jezebel. And he goes up there looking for a woman who was a Gentile. And this woman finds him. She comes, he's got this daughter grievously vexed with a demon. A, a very sad case of insanity. And what does Jesus say to her? Well, he says to her in verse 24, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus doesn't make it easy, does he? He wants this woman to actually plead and to beg and to express her faith. And she did that. And she asked what she said. You know, Jesus said to her, it's not me in verse 26 to take the children's bread and to cast at the dogs. You know, I'm the king of Israel. I'm here to preach the gospel first to Israel. And he's making her think. And she said, well, look, Lord, I'm happy with that. I understand that as a Gentile, I have very little right to what you have to offer. But I'm just a little puppy under the table. And I want just a crumb that falls off the table. Just give me a crumb, because I'm a humble puppy. And the Lord says to that woman, fantastic faith. O woman, great is thy faith, the Lord said. Great is thy faith. You know, the Lord was tremendously impressed with this woman. And you see, the Lord was trying to teach the disciples, because this is the kind of faith I want. I don't concerned about washing and kosher. What I want is people who really desperately want what the gospel has to offer, and they want desperately to come to me with this sort of thing. Great is my faith, and of course the daughter was healed. So you see, the Lord's trying to get them to see the contrast between the Pharisees and this woman. This woman got what she asked for. And when we come back to the record in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 15, we find that Jesus now goes across to a place called Decapolis. And when he did that, he was going into Gentile territory. He went up to a high mountain. This is in verse, um, come to verse 29. Jesus departed from thence and came nigh to the Sea of Galilee, into a high mountain. This is a looking place called Decapolis. And he sat down there, and a great multitude came to him, and there he is, all this record of all the ones that he healed on the mountain. Insomuch the multitude wondered, and they saw the dumb to speak, and so forth. But look at the end of verse 31. They glorified the God of Israel, because these were Gentiles. The Decapolis was a Gentile region on the east of the Lake of Galilee. So here we have Jesus healing thousands of Gentiles. And they glorified the God of Israel because they had seen that in Israel was salvation. 
And Jesus is now giving Jewish areas a wide berth. He wants to keep his disciples away from the influence of the Pharisees. He then proceeds in the feeding of the 4,000. We'll leave that record there because we'll deal with that when we come to Mark. And that goes through to the end of the chapter. But come to chapter 16. They go back across the lake to Magdala. So they're back now in Jewish territory. You've got to understand this, this, there's a contrast between Jews and, Jew- and Gentile territory here. So back to the Jewish side to Magdala. And immediately they get out of the boat and the Pharisees are waiting for them. And the Sadducees are there. The Herodians are there. And they say, we want a sign. We've heard that you are over there curing Gentiles. We want a sign. We demand a sign. Now the reason they asked for a sign was very interesting. One, they knew that he wouldn't give it to them so they could make him look silly. Did they need a sign when there were thousands of cured people on their side and on the other side of the lake walking around who'd been healed of all the infirmities? Did they need another sign? Of course they did. What they wanted to do was to tempt him to use his power like the tempter had done. You know, throw yourself off the temple. This was a, this was a chance to show that you are a big guy. And Jesus said you won't get any sign but the sign of the prophet Jonah, which of course was his resurrection that would come later on. He says you know the signs of the times. And you don't read them properly. Then we have this incident of the disciples having forgot to bring bread. And we'll come back to that in the record of Mark. But just notice in chapter 16 also the scathing denunciations we find in Matthew 16. You hypocrites in verse 3. In verse 4, you wicked and adulterous generation. In verse 11, beware of the leaven or the doctrine of the Pharisees. And again, the Lord, in front of his disciples, is berating these people to their face because of their hypocrisy. Take heed and let them alone. This is the message Jesus is trying to get through to his disciples. So let's go back to Mark chapter 7 and pick up the record there now and look at the same incident as Mark records it. You see, when Mark records the campaign in Decapolis in verse 31, again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came to the, by the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis, the ten cities on the east of <coughs> Galilee. So Jesus has come across now into Gentile territory. And we've got to remember that. He's in Gentile territory. But where are the thousands that Matthew spoke of? Not recorded here, are they? All we've got here is one deaf man. And you see, that's where Mark is being selected. He's saying, okay, well there were thousands cured around this time, but let's look at one man. And this was one that Jesus picked out of the crowd and you to come over here with the disciples and I want them to see your healing. As distinct from all the other thousands that were healed that day, or in that three days that they'd been there. Now let's look at what happened here. You see, we've got two individuals. The other one, as I said, at the end of of the feeding of the 4,000. We've got two miracles that are unique to Mark. Now, Mark is the only one that records these two miracles. The deaf man and the blind man. The lesson for the disciples is in Mark chapter 8 and verse 18. Having eyes, said Jesus, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? And do you not remember? And that's why the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the Gentiles, is surrounded by a deaf man and a blind man. Because the disciples were having a problem with their perception and with what they were listening to. And Jesus wants them to see that in these two carefully selected miracles that Mark records for us. See, that's why these two are here, framing the feeding of the 4,000. Let's pick up the record about, firstly, the man in Mark 7 and verse 32. As we said, he was in Decapolis, a Gentile area. This was where Legion had been. This is where Legion had gone around and had told everybody about his healing. Now they wanted Jesus to come to them. And there was tremendous enthusiasm for him. And then we find in verse 32, a Gentile, this was a Gentile, this was not a Gentile, this was a Gentile that Jesus chose. And the man, we're told, has an impediment in his speech. And that's a very key word. It only occurs twice in the Bible. It's in the Greek Septuagint in Isaiah 35 and verse 6 where it's translated, the dumb shall sing. Those who can't frame words. One thing you can do with people who are deaf is you can teach them to talk. But you will never teach them to sing. 
It's impossible if they haven't got hearing. So one of the joys of the kingdom we see the dumb sing. And that's the same word impediment we have here in the Greek New Testament. So we're going to see, and of course if you you know anything about the context of Isaiah 35, it's about the inclusion of the Gentiles. I'll leave you to search that out for yourself. Then in verse 33, they bring him to Jesus, and verse 33, Jesus takes him aside. There were two reasons for that. One, it is not always good to become the centre of attention if you're going to learn spiritual lessons. He needed space to appreciate the power of the healing. The other thing was he wanted the disciples to see this miracle different from the thousands of others. There was a lesson here. So what did Jesus do? Verse 33. The man kneeling down before him, Jesus gets his fingers and he goes like this. Into his ears. You know, that's a very strong word. It says he put his fingers. The word in the Hebrew is bellow, or in the Greek is bellow, which means to thrust or to throw. So Jesus goes up and he goes, doink into his ears like that. Very, very graphic. Now the man was there because he had an impediment in his speech. But Jesus says, your real problem is, you're deaf. And therefore you can't learn to talk properly. So, he put his fingers in his ears. We can't make any progress until the word goes into your mind. Then look what Jesus does. He then spits on his hand and puts it on the other man's tongue. Now that's a very deliberate action. We would probably today think twice about doing that. But Jesus did it because he wanted to teach a very powerful lesson. Why did Jesus do that? Well this is what it's all about. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren said the words of Moses, I'll put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So you see, God said, I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses and my words will be in his mouth and they've got to go from his mouth to other people and people must receive them. And by sign language, Jesus was teaching this man that what you need is to be able to hear my words. And you see, that's what happened. If people will not hear my words, then God says, I will require it of him. And Jesus said this in John 17 verse 8, I have given them thy words which thou gavest me. What did he do? He took the spittle from his mouth and he put it in that man's mouth. My words have to become your words. And what Jesus is trying to teach is sign language. And with the deaf you have to use sign language. So he's doing that. And you will believe that God has sent them if you take my words in for yourself. So you see, that's what Jesus is trying to teach. The cure of spiritual deafness and the inability to express the things of God is the fact that we've got to get the words of Christ because they are spirit and they are life. And then in verse 34, he again leads the man in sign language. The deaf are very good at following visual clues. So what Jesus says, okay, now we've got to realise that this power comes from God. So what does Jesus do? He looks up. What do you think the deaf man would have done? Looked up too. You see, he's following Jesus. This is the source of power. It comes from God. And then he says to him, Ephatha, which is, be opened. And that, of course, was what exactly what happened. But I want you to notice in verse 34, before he said that, he sighed. That's a very strong term in the Greek. It means to be in straits. Paul says in Romans 8, we groan in this tabernacle of the flesh today. In 2 Corinthians 5, we groan in this tabernacle with which we are burdened. For those of you who are young, you probably think, well, what's this groaning all about? Well, those of us who are in the 60 know what it's like just to get out of bed or out of a chair. Um, and you can't know which way to lie in bed sometimes. And you know what groaning is. And Jesus identified with human mortality, didn't he? Jesus felt very much physically the healings that he performed. It says in Matthew 8, verse 16, that Jesus took upon him and bare our iniquities. It wasn't just a matter of distance for Jesus. He was personally involved. Why did he weep at Lazarus' tomb? He knew he was going to raise the man. He wept because it was the mortality he was trying to deal with, and he felt that. 
So Jesus says in Aramaics, be opened. The man could lip read. Be opened. And he saw it. That is the same word you find in Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6. The eyes of the blind shall be opened and the, de- the ears of the deaf unstopped. And there's that same word in the Septuagint version, the Greek version of the Old Testament. That's the same word. Be opened. Be unstopped. Well, of course, he was healed. Straightway, which is Mark's favourite word, immediately his ears were opened and the string of his tongue was loosed and he spake plain. Now, just look at the things that happened to this man. You know, we're told that not only did he get his hearing back, but now he could speak with perfect diction. He could say exactly the words he wanted to say. And that was another miracle, not just to get his hearing back, but to get his speech perfected on the spot. He spake plain. Whereas before, he would have been very, very hard to understand anything he was trying to say. And Jesus said, don't tell anybody. But he did. And you can understand his joy. He went out, and his friends went out, in verse 34, the more a great deal they published it. And we're beyond measure astonished, saying, he maketh, he doeth all things well, he maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. You know, Robert Hens picks up the, the power of the Greek here. The, the AV, unfortunately, has really lost the intensity of the Greek. And superabundantly, they were being struck with astonishment, saying, well hath he done all things. Both the deaf he caused to hear and the dumb to speak. And there's a lot of power in the way they went out and just spread the news abroad. And what a difference to the man of the port of Bethesda. But, you know, they just couldn't contain their excitement. So they went out and proclaimed it. Beautifully or virtuously, he doeth all things well, they said. So the disciples then stayed in the campus and they were there for a total of three days. In chapter 8, verse 1, they had nothing to eat, and Jesus said, they've been here three days, and they've got nothing to eat. And in verse 2 of chapter 8, Jesus says something to the disciples he never says anywhere else. It says, Jesus said to them, I have compassion on the multitude. Now there are seven times we're told that Jesus had compassion, but this is the only time that Jesus said it about himself. I have compassion on the multitude. Well, the unspoken question is, what do you think about this multitude? Are you going to be like the Pharisees, who would say these are dogs of the Gentiles, that we shouldn't even touch or go anywhere near, or are you going to share my sentiment that these people, I love them because they come here, and they have sat here for three days with no food, and they haven't complained? What did Israel do in the wilderness after a couple of days with no food and water? They murdered against Moses. What did they do in John 6 when Jesus wouldn't provide the loaves? They all walked away. But this crowd had been there for three days with no food. Now, if Brother Barry got up and announced that we've cancelled food for the next three days, I think by come Saturday I'd be talking to myself. Would I not? But you see, they had been there three days to hear the words of Jesus and had nothing to eat. And Jesus said, I really feel for these people, but they're Gentiles. What do you think about them? And he puts the problem to the disciples. You know, why did Jesus throw this at the disciples? What are you going to do about it? He knew what he was going to do about it. But he says, what are you going to do about it? If I send them away to their houses, they will faint in the way, for a lot of them have come a long distance. I mean, Jesus is really putting the pressure on them. What are you going to do about it? Ah, uh, well, I mean, we can't, we haven't got enough money to buy bread for these people. It's in the wilderness. We're out in the wilderness. We're in the middle of nowhere. Excuses, excuses. So Jesus says, what have you got? That's a, that's a fantastic Bible principle. Go back to the, to the widow in the days of the sons of the prophets. You know, if the sons are in debt, she's going to have them taken away with these slaves. And the prophet says, what have you got? I've just got one little pot of oil. Just keep pouring it out into the other pot. Keep pouring it out. Whatever you've got, you've got to be prepared to commit. That's a great Bible principle. So Jesus says, well, what have you got? What are you going to give to the Gentiles? Well, we've got um, seven loaves. Oh, good. And so he feeds the 5,000. So we have here this tremendous feeding of the multitudes. Now, we need to just line up between the two feedings that took place. 
The first one was 5,000 people in Bethsaida. They were Jews. They sat on green grass. They had all the comforts of life. They had everything going for them. They had the five loaves, the books of Moses. They had the two fishes. So the five and two gave them the covenants of promise. They had the best of the fish. They had the first fruits of God. They had all the teaching of the prophets under their wing. They had all the opportunities to learn the gospel. And when the meal was finished, 12 small hand baskets of scraps were picked up so the hope of Israel can go to other people. The 12 disciples can go out and publish the gospel. Individual baskets, now go out. Go into the world and preach the gospel. Do every creature, said Jesus. That's what the 12 baskets were to symbolize. The 4,000, look at the different details. In the Decapolis, Gentiles, in the wilderness, seven loaves, a few fish, and the Bible uses a different word about these fish. These were the rubbish fish. These were the fish, and when the fisherman comes back in, he picks out all the good fish, and there's all the ones that nobody wants. He throws them over there, and the seagulls eat them. These were rubbish fish. But when the Gentiles had finished, there was an enormous quantity of food left over. Seven large hampers, not little hand baskets like the, in the, the, the Jews' case, now there's seven enormous baskets. These are the same baskets. When Paul was let down over the wall of Damascus, and a basket that could hold a man and lower him over a wall, that's the kind of basket this is. So there's different details here, isn't there? For the Jews and the Gentiles. So that's the miracle that takes place. And this is just what happens at the end of this miracle. Verse 10, straightway he got into a ship and he came to the parts of Dalmanutha, back to Magdala again, the same area that he'd been here before. And who's waiting on the shore? The Pharisees. And they've heard about Jesus feeding Gentiles. And again, this is where they asked for the sign. And notice it says in verse 12, Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. There's that groaning, in. oh no, these guys again. Here we go. And this sadness was for a different reason. He's now sad that they're hard hearted. He said, why do you seek out the sign? He says, back in the ship, we're going back to the other side. But on the way, look what happens. The disciples had forgotten to take bread. And all they had now was one loaf. I think that's a symbol of the fact that only Jews should be fed. So they've got one loaf for themselves, but they've got not enough bread to go around. And they worry that they're mumbling around about, oh dear, we should have gone and bought some bread while we're on shore. Jesus is thinking on a different plane. Now remember Jesus is trying to get to these disciples. He charged them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And of the leaven of the Herodians, not just Herod, but the Herodians. So you've got to be carefully said, these people that we just met on the, on the shore there are a corrupting influence like leaven. They will spread and spread and take over. And you can't conceive anything to them because the minute you give in on one thing, and say, well, perhaps washing is okay, then they'll want four things for you to do. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, of the Sadducees, and the Herodians. The Pharisees were about self-righteousness. The Sadducees were about self-satisfaction. They were very much into money and material things. The Herodians were the politicians, cozying up to Rome. And they were about preserving their position of importance. So Jesus said, they are leaven. They will corrupt you. Any small concession that you make to their traditions, to their politics and their man-made laws will be giving you a process of corruption and a movement away from the words of God. Beware of the leaven, he said. Beware of that corrupting influence. Leave them alone. Don't go near them. Don't listen to them. And you can see how concerned Jesus is to get the disciples to see that they've got to open their ears and their eyes to the great things of God and not to stay in Jewish tradition. Well, the disciples were struggling. Look at verse 16. Oh, we're getting told off because we forgot the bread. Did Jesus mention bread? He said leaven. But you see, they, you see how, how low they are down in their understanding. And Jesus just about had enough of them. Now, look what happens from verse 17 down through verse 21. When Jesus knew that all they're arguing about is who forgot to buy the bread, he says, why? Why are you talking about bread? 
Perceive ye not, neither understand. Are your hearts yet hardened? Having eyes don't you see? Having ears don't you hear? Don't you remember? Think about the 5,000, what I did, and how many baskets? Oh, 12 baskets, yeah, right. What about that? And the seven among 4,000, how many baskets took you up? Seven. He said, well, why don't you understand? Now, if I think you and I have been here amongst the disciples who said, well, understand what? But you see, the numbers, Jesus said, are significant. They're important. These are lessons I'm trying to teach you. Everything I do is a teaching mechanism. And you're not getting the point. You're not even thinking about it. Why don't you understand? Well, do we see anything there, brothers and sisters? Let's take some of the lessons that come out of the two miracles. The grace of God. Five thousand and five, the five loaves. The two fish gives you seven. The covenant. The Jews have the covenant, the gospel first. Twelve baskets left over for the disciples to use. The hope of Israel. The four square encampment of the four thousand will go to the Gentiles. The covenants of promise incorporate them as the Israel of God, the living, the four living ones. Redeemed out of all nations, as we find in Revelation. A huge provision made for future preaching. You know, God wants the gospel to go to all nations, so there's a huge number of, of scraps left over. Seven great big baskets for go to every nation under the sun. The covenant, the seven, is still available to the Gentiles. And Jesus says, don't you get any of this? Aren't you listening and watching what I'm doing? So what does he do now? He says, okay, come and watch this miracle. And so we come to verse 22. He came back to the other side. So back across to the lake again. And they bring a blind man to him and besought him to touch him. And it's, it's almost the same, Mark is saying, look at these two miracles. They parallel each other. He takes the man by the hand takes him outside the town, get him on his own, and we go through the same process. Now, notice this particular difference. The Lord spits on his eyes. He's a blind man. So the Lord now puts spit from his mouth onto his eyes and says, can you see anything now? The man flicks his eyelids and says, I can see men that look like trees. Now, is God incapable of healing a blind man? Jesus had killed thousands of them in the last few days. But in front of the disciples, Jesus says, here's a man who still, having received my words, still sees men like trees. What was the problem the disciples had? They were seeing men like the Pharisees as bigger than they really were. Jesus says the Pharisees are blind gods, they're hypocrites, they're weeds in God's garden, and you see them like trees. To you they are enormous things that frighten you. And you see, Jesus is saying to the disciples, that's what you are. You've got eyes that you don't see properly. You can't see through these men, you can't see what a danger they are to you. Beware of the leaven of these men, leave them alone. And Jesus is extremely frustrated here. And after that, in verse 25, he put his hands on his eyes and said, you've got to look up now. So he takes the man, touches his eyes and said, okay, now look to God. And he's teaching the man to pray. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And that's what Jesus wanted the disciples to come to. You have to come to the point where you understand that all flesh is grass and not trees. All flesh is grass, even those Pharisees, even those Jewish leaders. All flesh is grass and not trees. And Jesus is showing the disciples their problem. They saw men as much bigger than they really were. They gave credit to the Pharisees as being their spiritual guides. And you know, sometimes even in ecclesial life we can see men as trees to give them perhaps more respect than they deserve. It's quite possible, isn't it, to, to see men as trees. Why is it 
that we find it so hard sometimes to go out and to preach to our neighbours and our companions that we work with. Do we see them as trees or people that need to be saved? It's a very human failure. Let's not condemn the disciples too much. But to them, they had a problem with the Pharisees. What we need is a repeated application of the words of the Lord. And so it says there that he saw everything clearly. And we need, brethren and sisters, to see things clearly. You know, Jesus asked seven pertinent questions through that record at the end of the feeding of the 4,000. Do you not yet perceive? Do you not understand? Are your hearts hardened? Cannot you see? Cannot you hear? Do not you remember? How is it you do not understand? We must make sure, brethren and sisters, we take in very clearly every one of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The words I speak unto thee, they are spirit and they are life. I have given them my words, which thou gavest me, and they have received them. Let us make sure that we see, brethren and sisters, that all flesh is grass, but that the word of God abideth forever.